<laughs> okay. There we go. Take it away, man. Good. Excellent. So, first of all, thanks a lot for the war welcoming. I I really appreciate being among people with the same passion and, and seeing huge telescope. It's really, really great. Um, so we're going through an update uh, from last year's presentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be raising as much enthusiasm like, yes, there is like Chris or Dan, there is now the final project, you see it and so on. But we're getting closer and it's giving me the chance to uh, talk about a couple of processes and a couple of subsystems that we put some uh, effort into in the, last, in the last year. So just a brief recap. Uh, we're a small team, we're a bunch of guys in, in Northern Italy, uh, <clears throat> but I live in London, I live in I work in London. So sometimes logistics will be tricky and it's a two hours, two hours flight, but uh, we try to do the best, uh, uh, getting the best um, out of that. Um, so we're gonna recap just very quickly what is uh, this project is all about. And um, this is a long description to say, to frame a little bit the vision that, that, that we have. And that is, uh, we, I think, we think that there's a, there's, there's a gap between amateur astronomy and professional astronomy. Uh, you see that in diameters and, uh, and but you see also in the number of people. There's a lot of amateur astronomers that are taking exquisite, long hours of integration, they're taking nice pictures. So the question is, can we translate some of this energy into taking data for uh, doing science? Uh, and this telescope is, uh, this telescope itself is just a milestone of a bigger picture. That is, uh, the, the telescope itself that we're going to talk about in a, in a minute is, uh, is a proof of concept to me so that in the future, somebody can look at that and say, oh, if I follow exactly the, the, the instruction that will be open source and, and available and the processes, I can achieve the performances that the, these uh, uh, proof of concept is showing. So what are the performances? This needs to be a, a, a large telescope being able to uh, do long exposure, basically. You can then remotize it and, and running a script, uh, which are subsequent uh, steps. But the big uh, vision here, and I know it's very ambitious, is uh, I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that, is uh, we're not even getting to the, the final uh, step of the, of the project. But the, the vision is that, to me, success looks like a university in uh, Bangladesh with low budget, or a group of amateur astronomers in Argentina, or a crazy guy in Australia, or a guy in the Philippines, following the processes, they can build an object that can achieve this level of performances, right? So every single step, material, process, I think that we had uh, um, conceived here, it has in mind, can the guy uh, source uh, the material anywhere in the world? Uh, sometimes in Europe or in the United States, finding some, uh, the supply of some items is way easier than in other parts of the world. So that means that in terms of material is way lighter in terms of uh, cost and so on. It takes a big toll on process uh, because you need to make the, the material a bit um, uh, working in a smarter way somehow. So just recapping the feature of this, uh, uh, this telescope, it's uh, uh, right now is an 800 millimeter. The first mirror is an 800 millimeter with a focal length that is equal to an F3.4. Uh, it is altas because it has to be, to be honest, with this kind of dimension, I see that it is it's absolutely shared driver and encoders for based on the uh, site tech too. It needs to be transportable in my mind. It, it is fairly lightweight. Uh, it is definitely the kind of stuff that you wanna 
keep it in a certain in a place, but you can you can take it down and transport it uh, in some way. To European standard, you can put it in a small bag uh, in terms of dimension, just about. Uh, we don't have this huge pickup truck. Yes, got the four inches focus there because I say okay, let's, uh, and it is need it is, has a D rotator and a guider integrated into that. All right, so uh, another slide about what is driving us in in the project is uh, no frills, meaning that it's something really think it it doesn't really add much to the project when not adding that not because it's beautiful not because everybody's doing that if we don't think it's really driving uh, us closer to the success of the project we take it off we don't care and every kind of decision we try uh, it's not easy but we try to have it data driven science driven Some, sometimes it's easy sometimes a little bit more tricky but that is uh, uh, our uh, intent. Uh, and of course, everything needs to be, as I, as I stressed earlier, DIY friendly. Um, so what in your progress made is we had bits and, bits and pieces one year ago, uh, and we recently were able to pull it all together. I think the, the picture on the right is telling two things. One is that, uh, we just made it to the ceiling. It's like it's <laughs> half an inch to the ceiling. <laughs> this is like we we were a little bit baffled about how big it is. Uh, and yeah, the the garage is getting is getting uh, is getting smaller uh, with the stuff uh, out there. And but yeah, it was a big satisfaction to see the the whole thing uh, being put together. Uh, now, the, and jumping to the, the, the conclusion of the presentation that we had last year, uh, and then we're going back to another few uh, points, cost and timing. These are just a, I have a, this is my legacy from the automotive um, industry. I'm running a so-called bill of material. So I'm an a spreadsheet listing all the components and the, the percentage of completion, the weight, and the cost, the sourcing and annotation, whatever it is. So right now, all these numbers do not include the mirror because I think the mirror is a project by itself. And incidentally, we have a pink mirror now, we have another blank. I really think that it would be third um, time charm. Third uh, time charm? No. Third time the charm. Third time the charm. So we have one, um, mirror right now, we're going to talk about that. We have already blank, uh, ready to uh, be ground. Uh, but from experience, you need to go through a few mirrors before you say, yeah, this one, I'm really, really happy with that. That happened with our 20 inches. So we think we need to go through that. So these numbers are reflecting the telescope, uh, but the uh, part of the, the, the mirror, the primary mirror, so the secondary mirror included. So we are approaching the end of that. It, we didn't really put a lot of money, so it's not cheap, but uh, it is, uh, it, we, uh, we've been very uh, skimping on a lot of stuff. So we, we kept an eye on budget every single time we took a design decision, a design decision from the very beginning of design needs to is to um, address that. And right now it is around, uh, I think that numbering in pound is around 200 pounds, something like that. So it's, every single part is not heavier than uh, 20, 25 pounds. So you can, apart from the dimension itself, you can uh, easily end up by, by a single person. Um, so what happened in this year? And uh, so we carried out and proof one of the main processes that we developed. I'm gonna talk about that uh, later on. And these, um, uh, we're gonna consider that we executed three major parts, the true union and the, and the azimuth table. We finalized the mirror cell and uh, the motor assemblies with the, with the CTEC motor. So let's dive into that. 
uh, a little bit more in detail. So this is the process uh, of grinding. So I need to spend few few words so that we we contextualize this. Uh, I call this a, a sophisticated version of the lazy season. So to me, like from a mechanical point of view, uh, a telescope is like you need to have two bearings. Then usually the the uh, the altitude is split into into additional bearings, but you need to have two rolling surfaces that are at the same grade of a bearing. How can you do that on the cheap side? So uh, I use here one of the concepts of Colin Chapman, who's the founder of Lotus Automotive, that is like, let's have one component doing two things. So integrating two functions into one component. And that component is the azimuth table. You see the picture, uh, the upper picture is the table as it as it looks like upside down. So these three leg things is the, is the tripod. And, uh, and the tripod has, uh, has three assemblies of bearing. There's a um, bigger picture here. So effectively you have a, a track on the uh, outside perimeter almost of the, of the azimuth table that is 1.2 meter in diameter. And you have, uh, and he's resting on three pieces. So he's isostatic or isostatic. I don't know how you. So that is a perfect setup of engineering. So effectively, you have a lot of precision in the bearing. By the way, this is a skate bearing, mm -hmm. damn dirty cheap. How do you get, where do you need to put a lot of effort here to achieve the level of, the right level of precision? Is in, uh, is in the in the track. The track needs to be basically a flat surface with, uh, and it's just like a track of a of a of a huge bearing. How how can you do that? Long pause and a lot of execution time execution here. So the the idea is uh, if you look at the scheme on the on the the guy on the left, you have this is the table the azimuth table, and the idea is like. Purely geometrical. If you can rotate something that is gen around an axis, you're effectively generating a, a, a surface, a track that is, that is part of a single surface. You just need a, 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 a one inch wide track, but you're generating that. Is uh, the idea is um, is basically I don't take these work piece into a CNC shop. I build, a, I build a, a grinding machine on the workpiece. It's one off. All these items that I did you see here, like I think this most expensive part is this angle grinder. All of this is uh, 100 bucks. All right, so two bearings, two, two inches bearing space, so they are a little bit more robust. This is a car axle for carting we used so for free and you have this con contraption i think is the is, it, is the fancy english word well you have everything that is rotating around this axle on bearings on fairly precise bearing and you have an angle grinder with a diamond cup that is grinding a uh, a, a track that uh, that is made of carbon fiber. So like we got like six arches of uh, two or three millimeter thick carbon fiber, 150 K probably, 150 bucks. We glue to the, to the bottom of the table. We put in, in place this stuff. And the idea was very sensitive. The idea, no, don't worry. This is the wheel. Oh. And the idea is that with a grind, with this homemade grinding machine, you are generating this surface. This on paper, it was in my head, and we did, did a lot of preparation. How does it end up? It, you don't really know because you are looking at microns. And microns, I think we looked at that. Yeah, yes, it's like, is a is fraction of a tau, isn't it? Exactly. So let's see if this, 
And so the noise is annoying. It was very annoying also when I was working. So this just gives an idea of what you do. It just the light cuts going around. Just not, put, not putting any kind of pressure. Just let the diamond cup grinding the, the, the carbon fiber away. And you see here that this part is ground and this is not. So you keep adjusting with two, two silly screws that you, that you can have a height adjustment. Yeah, Side, yes, that, that we, very, very good. So this is a mic, this is micron, so whatever. And uh, this was just half away. Uh, but we, 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 we measured that. And when we decided that it was all right, it was uh, 91 microns, run out, total run out. That is, uh, we checked that, yes, it's three, three to four thousand, isn't it? Now, for a homemade contraption that I'm pretty sure that I, if I'm writing it down properly and with the visual help of video, I can tell anybody in the world that has uh, some uh, DIY inclination that he can do, that he can achieve very similar results. Right. So, Let's see if I can stop it because it's not really. So does it work? Those are my, those are my feet. I, I was meant to, to measure the, the torque that you need to calculate for the, for the motor. I, as soon as you pull with a little string, a tiny string, it moves. So it's, I wouldn't say frictionless, but there's really, it's, I'm, I'm very happy with the result wasn't really the friction what I was looking at. It was more like how accurate and flat in terms of run out the, the, the track is. And I'd say that, 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 they, that it works. Um, so this is an example of a heavy process, dirty, cheap material. I mean, I know that carbon fiber is not considered cheap, but in the overall, in the overall vision of the of the project you were talking about spending 150 pound of uh, of uh, sorry 150 bucks of carbon fiber uh, water jet cut and and there you go you can do something like that same process we we applied it to sorry i think there you go same process we applied to the what we call Pac-Man, that I think it's trunion, isn't it? Trunions. Uh -huh. So what, we're, what we've done here is that we pack them together. So basically they are like four to five inches in, in uh, thickness. We bolt it to these uh, elements. So they are hanging by a, by a, by a desk. And a similar concept, so you need to figure that out with a little bit of imagination. Maybe it's easier here. You have these axes. It, it, again, you have two bearings here and you basically have a grinding machine built on top of the, of the work piece that you need. Testing, one, two. Hi, Russ, we can hear you. Could you please uh, mute? So the thing is that <clears throat> you can, I could have easily taken to a CNC shop and say, look, can you figure it out? Can you just grind this stuff in a proper way, spending, I don't know, five, six hundred um, euros and getting it done. But it wasn't in the ethos of the, of, the, of the project. My project is like, can I tell a guy in a university from India how to do that? And I know that it was, we, we, I, I can teach him how to do that. Huh? Because it's also silly, silly, uh, simple once you think about that. Um, so we ended up, we had several tests, to be honest. This was a, like a long strike of failure until we find the, the right way to do that. So for example, at the beginning we thought about, well, let's get only an, a one inch 
um, a shaft that are, these are already ground, so they're very precise, and and glue some sandpaper around them. It didn't work. Uh, the idea originally was to use uh, stainless strips attached a glue to the to the surface here to the outer surface, and uh, I, it didn't work out. Uh, it is too takes too too much time. We had a, a lot of passion to do the work with the grinder. That it was like a few millimeter thick. This is like five inches almost. It, it, it there was no chance. So <clears throat> one day we thought about well, let let's use carbon fiber. is going to be very easy to remove from a uh, with a with a grinding wheel. It is going to be uh, strong enough to withstand the Persian contact forces, so that is not degrading after a while. Uh, it's going to create a bolt load of uh, of dust uh, while we're going to use some uh, some uh, some protection there so we ended up using some super cheap um, grinding uh, wheels here the only sheet that i had is that i take it to a, a grinding shop and then i got it dressed so there was in in uh, in um, uh, coaxial to the shop to be honest, I think you don't need that because somehow, given the fact that the stuff is spinning, is is, is dressing itself against the uh, the stuff. But it was like, yeah, let's get the the highest chance. Now, this is just like a funny time lapse of what we're doing. So me and my my guy, you see who is the clever guy. In uh, me, I'm using two COVID recycled masks, and the guy is basically on a smart suit. This, this stuff is making a lot of um, a lot of, uh, of of dust, but once you have, you spend ten times more in the setup and in the preparation than in the actual machine. The actual machine, once you're set up, is is damn easy. That is actually studies falling with the with the uh, vacuum cleaner to to get uh, rid of most of the of the dust. So in this case, just uh, the the carbon fiber was applied in with in, in the standard method. We we bonded, uh, I think, a total of eight layers of fabric, uh, and uh, yeah, it is was more than enough in terms of stock removal because it, once you uh, the uh, run out pre-check at the beginning is alright. Can't remember exactly what was the accuracy of the run out, but it is in the same order of magnitude. Maybe, maybe a little bit better than the than the um, than the azimuth table. So that to me was really we spent a lot of time of this year making these two parts because it was yes making the two parts, but was also uh, validating this kind of process and making sure that anybody could do that. As stupid as we are, so, so if, if we can do that, anybody in the world can do that. Anyway. Uh, so it was uh, interesting, and I'm very glad that we make it make it work because it was not really a it wasn't really a given. It was one of the um, uh, gambling that we were making on the project. Um, the other sub assembly that we finalized is the mirror cell, twenty seven. Uh, Point. Um, it is pretty low profile. I'm using, I think, something that you then dis discarded some time ago when you were talking about yours. But we're using um, ball, no ball bearings. So the, the inch bearing, uh, it's a bearing that is, um, I don't have a picture, I can't remember what it is. It's not ball bearing, but ball bearing is not the one. But it, all of these, the, the upper triangle are able to rotate freely on a single bearing. You help me out if you a remember. Spherical it's bearing. spherical bearing, great. So this one is a Teflon uh, line bearing. It's not a brass or uh, art uh, steel. So it actually is very compliant. You, you can move it. There's not any uh, stickness to that. So I, I think it's gonna work, but I'm happy to, to change the design. Uh, again, here the the reason of these real shapes is that 
first of all, I just wanted to uh, use some FE analysis to make the, the stuff uh, as light as possible. And since this was going to be cut with a laser, uh, sorry, with a water uh, jet, let's say, uh, that is coming for free. So it's all aluminum? It is the top triangles are aluminum because I need a five millimeter thick aluminum, always five millimeter and one quarter, one quarter. Yeah. For the for the three main ones, I should have added an eight millimeter, so a third of a of an inch, and that start being fairly expensive because these parts are also like four, 14 inches long, they are fairly fairly big. So I say no, no, no. Let's let's try to do it on the cheap side as we usually do. So that is actually just. Um, Iron, uh, steel. Now, I wouldn't even call it steel, but oh, okay. really the, the lowest grade of, uh, of steel that you can find. They are, they are cut out because I wanted to match the, uh, the deflection of each and every point. So effectively, all of these are, all these pockets are light weightening this stuff in order that it would match the, the weight of an eight millimeter um, aluminium. Instead, this one is a four millimeter uh, steel. And so it's light weighting and it also it, the compliance is, uh, is the same on all this point, theoretically. Um, the other thing that I would drive your attention is that this, this cell is floating somehow. So given the fact that I have whiffle trees, the whiffle tree needs to be Work properly. So that needs always to be at the same um, at the center of gravity. So it needs to move during collimation with the uh, with the mirror. So effectively, this is uh, inched on top of the uh, lower frame that we call the H frame. It's actually more like a two-step ladder, to be honest. And uh, it is inched in the upper side here. And there are two points here. Well, I don't have a, a, a nice picture of that, but I there are actually two motors with the two twelve motors with a redu gear reduction. So effectively, the idea is that once you are looking at your eyepiece or sitting uh, at your uh, in front of your computer, you can actually move the you probably made the primary only with uh, uh, electrical. It works. It, it, it's the fact that it's, uh, there's a lot of torque in those those motors and. Uh, not much of a um, much of weight of the of the mirror. But so, what's next? How are we doing with time? Doing good. Excellent. So I have only a few few other, few other slides. Um, motor assembly. I think this is just give me the the chance to speak about the the fall that we're trying to fight off, and is backlash. So the entire drive system is conceived to either avoid or uh, um, having the lowest backlash that you, that, you can, uh, that you can think of. So it is a, in total, I think is a 9,000 to one ratio. Most of that is achieved by the, by, uh, by, I'm not touching this anymore. Oh, okay. By friction drive, so the, the perimeter of the trunions are rolling on uh, ground bar. I think it's a very, we're all familiar with, with this concept. And the same concept of that we've seen previously on the azimuth table, two of the assemblies are free to roll. The third one is motor driven. So it's actually is a again a sixty to one ratio right at the beginning, and uh, so for example, this assembly on the right is for the altitude and movement. So this is just a kind of a mock-up, but you might think that it's going to be uh, put in this position. And there's a I opted for a um, harmonic drive. This is a hundred to one. Of course, it's cheap because it's coming from Taiwan, coming from an unknown 
robot, I think. So I got it, crossing my finger, I stripped it off completely, replaced the bearings, and then put it back uh, together, degrees and clean and putting the... So it, it's working absolutely fine. And the other point is that I, uh, not disrespect here, I, I took away the, uh, the gear head on top of the sidekick motor. This is a, almost a 10 to one. And there was it's like three or four gears. There's quite some backlash compared to what we're trying to achieve. So took it off. We put a, a and we, we replaced it with a pulley. Here you, what you see here that is missing is a tensioner. So again, it's not a, a, a zero backlash system, but it is as close as, as I think you can get to with, uh, within a certain kind of budget. So this one is the azimuth and slots in basically in one of the, of the legs because one of the assembly of the roller assembly is actually driven directly out of the, out of this, if it makes sense. Why not? Thank you. So what is next? We're getting to the last part. And uh, it's gonna be a little bit of preaching here. So it's like, I'm looking from an engineering point of view to a, to a telescope is, I think it's very rewarding because it's a, it's a, it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky structure. Let me get to that in a second. First of all, is that <clears throat> I was uh, uh, bragging there that I want to be data or science driven in all of our, all of our uh, technical decisions. A way to do that is using FEA, final element analysis, and you can do use that for a lot of stuff. Now, this is clearly something that I've, I've used at work uh, for many years, not me personally, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm awful at that. Uh, there's a lot of smarter people than me that are using these, uh, these, um, these programs. I'm just, I'm just fairly good at interpreting the result and, and and putting action to corrective action in place. But the, the three areas that you can use this stuff is basically deflection analysis. So like this is like when the old thing is pointing 45 degrees, for example, how much does the, the basically the secondary mirror moves out of the axis of the, of the, of the primary. And you can actually, Funny enough, you can actually engineer compliance so that the, the, the secondary is gonna move no matter what, small or, or, or big is gonna move. In our case, it's like one, I think 0 0.15 millimeters. Again, sorry for that, I don't know how much is in, uh, in it's, a tiny, it's a tiny amount, but you can also put compliance in the supporting um, uh, frame of the mirror so that that gives up as well, and it gives up in the same direction. So it's actually start pointing slightly toward again the center of the of the secondary mirror. Now we are talking about actually trying to minimize everything and using this kind of tool in order to know where you're going to and having a, an idea if that is too much or is uh, or is good enough. What software do you use? Uh, we use different kind of software. Uh, ANSYS usually, uh, and Nastron, I think at the, at the very beginning. Uh, but the free CAD that is free, there's, there's very similar uh, uh, capabilities. It, it's a little bit more cumbersome to, to make it work, but I use, that, I use that too, to be honest. Now, stress analysis, why you bother to, to see what, what are the stress in a telescope? The reason is that, and this like is, a, is an example, it's, a, it's perfectly describing how you can put that at work for you. Like red is, is uh, where there are the highest stresses in the telescope. Blue is where you basically do not have stress. So from an engineering point of view, that means, to any engineer would mean one single thing take material off with the blue part because they're not doing anything effectively. So that's the reason why if you see the, 
the picture of the actual telescope, we start carving out bits and pieces uh, uh, in order to save weight uh, from areas that actually do not contribute at all or very small, uh, a very small contribution to the uh, uh, structure of the telescope. Uh, why we're doing that? Why, why I'm so obsessed with lightweight? This is easier to transport, fair enough. But there's a much more important element here is that, and is related to the dynamic analysis. And, uh, and I, I get into that in a, in a second. But first of all, to me, it's like, why a telescope is a very interesting engineering structure. I thought long about that, and I can't really um, think about any other object that is that is not designed for um, to failure. Let's put it this way: you design a an elevator, the the wire is like you do your calculation, maximum load is going to break uh, with the with the weight of ten people, and then you add your um, uh, uh, safety margin or safety coefficient. 99.9% .9 of the engineering world of the start cars, any, even the table to an extent, is like, even when the, the case of a, of a laptop is like the case where you are coming to break in the, the component and then you're adding your safety factor. And it can be in, a, in an aircraft is very small, otherwise you won't take off. In an elevator is huge. In a car is different. So, but it, that is your for an engineer is the is the goal, and thinking about where is going to break, where is the yield stress, and then playing with that the, the way you want. The telescope, the the most stress part, the one for example that I in, in red there, I think they're a thousand times less stress than the the uh, breaking point. So it's completely dif different approach. And the parameter that makes all of these sense is uh, is actually the combination of two different par engineering parameters. One is the is uh, weight, and the other one is uh, is stiffness. So, and they are not always playing in your favor every time. You need to be quite smart about that. Huh? Uh, and just for example, a, a Quarter bolt, quarter inch bolt, for example, we talk about stresses and so on. You can hang a European car and it's not going to break. Because you're going to need a third inch for, for a pickup truck. But there's a lot of the, the material that we're using uh, and it can withstand um, stresses that, are, that the telescope will never ever see. So the way to think about conceptualizing the design of a telescope is completely different. I've seen a lot of people using the wrong mindset and approaching start and, and usually it's taking you to over engineer, over design parts. And when it comes to a structure like that, you maybe make the, the top of the telescope heavy and you're getting into trouble that the dynamic analysis is, uh, is, uh, is gonna show uh, in a second. So, I'm just getting my, my preach. And now we're gonna have a, very, a crash course, a 30 second crash course in, the, in the dynamic analysis in, from engineering. The one on the left, you might, it helps me to, to show you the, the concept of a string, of an, an instrument. Huh? Have you ever thought about why you're playing your, a note on a guitar and you're playing the same note on a piano? The note is the same, but the sound is completely different. Where does that come from? So in, uh, in, in musicology, that the term is, I think, is timbre. And it's coming from the fact that your string has a natural frequency. So it is natural way of reacting to an external perturbation in, in case of a, a guitar is plucking. That is like, the one that is that is here this is like the the the, not the natural frequency, but it doesn't react just like that. It reacts in a lot in it effectively an infinite number of different ways that are dictated by its geometry basically. Uh, mm -hmm. So effectively, a 
uh, timber, so how a note sounds out of a piano or an out of a guitar is simply the fact that there are different uh, coefficient applied to each and every of these, and they're making up the entire sound of that, of, of coming from that string. So would you call it harmonics as well? That is, that is if you're, if you are uh, playing guitars and you are putting your finger into one of these notes, for example, you're basically muting the first natural frequency and you're playing the first harmonic. And is so there's a harmonics in engineering, there's a harmonic in, uh, in, in playing guitar as well. Why am I wasting your time about the guitar strings and so on? Because effectively, the string is a, one of the most simplified structure that you can analyze with dynamic analogy. But you can use that on any given more complicated structure. Telescope is a very interesting uh, field to apply this kind of analysis because it's telling you uh, where you are, where your design is actually failing because you, you have a, a maybe a small part of the telescope that is not uh, strong enough. Huh? And is, I tell you, I tell you, it's usually not what you think. It baffled me many times and me another uh, engineer. So this is an example of the first a frequency of the telescope that we that we put it together. This is before the correction that we put in place. So the, this is, you might look at this as a, a highly exaggerated movement if you are slightly punching the telescope. The we are fairly familiar with this because uh, when there's a little bit of uh, uh, wind or someone is touching your telescope, it start it start vibrating. So the the oscillation, the frequency of the oscillation, and now is the damping in time. It is analyzed in this way, and this is a very powerful tool to tell you what to do. So here it is like a, a close up of the area that is causing the structure to have uh, to have this kind of frequency. The first, the lower the frequency, so the, the lower the frequency, the, no, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but the more energy is involved. So the first uh, natural frequency is the one to be addressed. And, and it needs to be a kind of a design goal. It needs to be over a certain uh, Either look at different white, white books or white paper from, GMT, the, the, the VLT and so on, they are going through all these analysis big, big time. And is the way they are designing the entire structure around. And just to give an example, because the, the higher is the, the weight of the structure, the lower the frequency. And uh, for example, the VLT has, uh, I think it has a natural frequency of two or three Hertz is very low but you then have adapt, uh, active optics to deal with that. For a system like this, I really thought that we need to go over 20 Hertz. So, and again, that is make, the, the idea is that is helping me to have a, 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 a structure that is sound and that it breaks the negative, the, sorry, the positive feedback loop. Because uh, really, if you have a if you have a driving if you ever had in your in your life an experience with a driving system that is not really very accurate in in, uh, in tracking, sometimes is because the motor are are also are moving the the scope, but they also uh, the perturbation of the system, and then you have a, a, a telescope that is floppy, it will start resonating. You, not going to see that, it's not going to point in the right direction. So I got this from my, from my um, job, but I've seen uh, that all the big telescopes around the world are, are basically uh, uh, engineering their design around the, the dynamic analogy. Unfortunately, it's not super easy, clearly, uh, but it's a, such a powerful tool, such a powerful tool to. Uh, make sure that, that, that your design is good to go. I spent a year 
with the with another engineer to do the first uh, version of the telescope and we thought yeah we're good engineer we're gonna we're gonna nail it we're running through the uh, the analysis and we we completely miss a couple of small areas that we easily addressed afterwards and we said now after then a year and a half said yeah i think i have on my end a, a a design that I can go back to the astronomy club and say, guys, I think this can work. Mm -hmm. Again, sorry for my preaching. This is like, I think this is the different approach that because I've never seen it applied in, a, in amateur astronomy. I've seen it in a, uh, in a professional observatory, but it is a, a, maybe not a super simple tool, but it's so, so powerful to make sure that what you're gonna get uh, is uh, is up to the task, and in this case, for being an, an imager and in a in a system with uh, motors, and if you're an auto guy, that you can have a feedback. You need to be sure that you have uh, you need to avoid uh, positive feedback because otherwise, you're not going to have a, a, a reliable a reliable tracking. Now, I'm going to end up very quickly now with uh, just a few words about the mirror that to me are like are a, a project side. And uh, so the next steps quickly are, we're gonna do the start test in a week, possibly. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna silver that, the, the mirror. We're gonna start salvaging the meniscus, the Canadian meniscus uh, to try a second mirror. And I, honestly, uh, being realistic rather than looking at negatively or positively and stuff, I think we're gonna go through a third mirror as well. Most cases, we're gonna have a lot of big mirrors around that we can, we can end out. Uh, so right now, the first mirror, uh, we are not holding our breath, I think is the English term, because we, we really want to start out of enthusiasm on a 25 millimeter, so one inch, Flat blank, which is like is really extremely a thin now in the in the center. But I said, well, no, it was also a good run to uh, take the rust away of the grinding machine that we are going to use for the for the subsequent uh, mirror. Uh, so to me, silvering, fast optics, and meniscus are as a personal speculation. I think is the path for the uh, a bright future of amateur astronomy with the big telescope. Uh, silvering because it, you don't want to ship your precious big optics to a place and then spending a lot of money. Fast because you need to try and have a compact design. So with a bigger diameter, you need to contain your focal length. And meniscus because from an engineering point of view, it's better than a flat is saving a boatload of grind hogging time. Hogging is like, it, it's a lot of time just to get to the, to the curvature with the, with the 80 grid or stuff, stuff. So all of these, I think uh, are very interesting things in the, in, uh, to look up in the future. Um, the next step in terms of project this is like the short term is getting the secondary mirror on. We have it already, it's actually a, a big flat that we already had. So we're gonna adapt it for the, for the uh, start test. And then we're gonna carve it out. I don't know, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, make an, an elliptical secondary mirror out of that. Uh, I need to finalize the moving scenery in the transportation system. I, I have all the parts around and need just to put it back together and the feet that are coming out of that. So very important, that is an easy part that can be overlooked and is gonna screw up all the uh, uh, robustness of the, uh, of the project. Uh, start test silvering, we're gonna install in the encoder, the motor assembly, and I think there's gonna be a lot of debugging because the encoders are not they are a, 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 I can say, a delicate, delicate system. Um, can you uh, uh, expand on your encoder? Yeah, so again, how can I, how can I, how can I do an encoding system on, on the chip? Because like the, the resolution that you need 
is very high. You need 10, 12 million ticks uh, per axis. And if you're buying a RAM, you know better than me. I, know, I, know, I didn't even dare to ask. I think it's gonna set you off two or three grand for, a, for, a, um, for an encoder. Is there a different way to do that? Uh, so, yes. So I actually conceive also other, other <laughs> more creative way to do that. But for the first step, uh, it's what I understood is that it's very, it's fairly cheap to find with that. And I think because salvaging yards are like CNC machine, strip it off, usually you get it with the, with the wiring of the scalp. It's fairly easy to find uh, read heads. I, I got two read heads for 150 pounds. Huh? What is way more complicated and sometimes expensive is to find the tape. That is like is a 0.2 millimeter. Sorry about that. I don't know what is in. It's a very, very thin <clears throat> uh, stainless steel strip with a grating. I think it's for a grating is etched at first and then is gold plated. So I got a reel actually from the US. Uh, it didn't cost me that much. Well, I think for a total of 400 bucks. So it with five, 600 bucks, I have all the parts, all the hardware to make the, uh, to make the system. Okay, that's incremental. Incremental, they are, they are incremental. Uh, so for example, the Trunion, again, in the Colin Chapman uh, mindset of having something doing two things. Uh, the, the surface that we generated is a perfect surface. You can lay a, the strip of the encoder. So that is, uh, the encoder suffers a lot if you have a run out so that the, the, the strip is going closer or farther from the read head. And you don't want the movable read head. It needs to be the, 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 this, the gap between the read head and the, and the strip needs to be very controlled. I think it's plus and minus 1, 0.1 millimeter. So it's very, it's very cheap. Going to be part of the debugging. I took that into consideration in the, in the design. It is going to work. Who knows? To me, it's more a matter of having the, the willpower to go through and plow through all the mistakes that you always do at the making all this kind of stuff. But that is to me is like, how can you, can you save money instead of spending two, three grand on a, on a, on a new, uh, encoder from Rennie Show and trying to do that with parts that you can you can find somehow around. They're not easy to find, but you can save a lot of money uh, for doing that. And I think that is one of the one of the areas. The other thing, just to, to elaborate on your question very quickly, Rennie Show as a as a parent company that is a so I think it's a Croatian or, or a Slovenian company they acquire. They're not using optical encoding, just like the red issue that we're talking about, is the stuff that you have on, on, on your scope too, but they're using a, a magnetic strip. It's very similar, it is very similar um, uh, resolution, so it's sub micron. It just suffer from uh, hysterity. So basically it works perfectly fine when you're tracking one direction, but when you are inverting, you might lose a little bit. Like so, exactly. So for, for a professional uh, uh, telescope, for playing way, we'll never use that. It doesn't make any sense. But for an amateur that will say, yeah, maybe I need to, every time that I'm going completely on the other side, I need to resend it slightly, it might make sense. The, the RLS, I think is the name of the company, is way, way cheaper than it. Like it's a tenth of what you can buy with the, with the running show. So that might be something to explore. Uh, yeah, some, some of our, our customers that go on our list have tried, I don't know if it was that particular magnetic encoder, but uh, magnetic encoders suffer from cyclical error for the, yeah. uh, uh, more than the optical one. Yeah. To me, what I, I got into several phone calls with the, with the guys and I got a little bit technical. What I understood is that when is, the problem is when you are reversing the motion. Somehow it's like, so it probably depends very much on what kind of uh, 
observation you are planning to do. If you have a script that is taking five seconds exploit and needs to put it on a place and that, it's going to be probably a, a disaster. If that is like you have a session, you're running a script and it's like spending a lot of time on a, on a, on a target and move it to another target, you tend to recenter that slightly. That might more, uh, have more sense. Uh, on a longer term, and this is back to the vision of the project, this is what we're trying to do. So first of all, is really like validate the entire project from a correlation with the, the FEA, but it also say, yes, this works. These are the performance which you can track as, as long as you can, and it's gonna, it's gonna be all right. But from a design point of view, I have a lot of ideas to simplify even more the, 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 the design. And we're gonna find a home for the telescope. We are, we are, we, well, I'm not living there anymore, but the telescope is being built in one of the worst area, probably in Europe, like pollution and fog and so on is, is open. So we're gonna make sure that it's working there. And my idea is to donate it to a small observatory so they, that we can remotize it and, uh, and having somebody that is, uh, that is running some maintenance and stuff like that. And, and so that there is the idea to, uh, for, for that specific um, uh, um, telescope. The other thing is that, and again, is my vision of success that there are gonna be many replicas of that telescope. And it doesn't need to be the same thing. I see that more as a platform. You, have, you want to have it 25 inches, you want to have it 35 inches. The, the, you can scale it up and down fairly easily with a good level of confidence that is gonna bring you to the result that I cannot show you today. Sorry for that. Maybe in a year time, we can say, yeah, it is working. But that is the idea. I'm validating the, pro, the, the processes to build a telescope that gives you this kind of performance. And then anybody in the world can access to open source CAD models, process description, drawing, and whatever is the support that we can give and replicate that or just in, in, in pure open source uh, 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 style, just like slightly uh, ameliorating that or making it slightly different for suiting for their, their own, uh, their own um, uh, needs. So I think this bring me to the end. So thanks a lot. Uh, we, I'm, I'm putting a little bit of thought to have a, a YouTube page where I'm actually describing the process and an Instagram for uh, the various updates apart from a couple of threads on Loudy Nights and the and the British one, I can't remember exactly the name right now. So it's, it's a really, it's not a matter of, how can I say, oh, I want a lot of likes. It's more a matter of, I, I, I want to describe what we're doing to most, more, most people that we can. So they, they might be, maybe not them, maybe a friend of them, their, their son or someone would be, would be interested in this project. And if we're gonna fail, I, I think I, I concluded last year in the same way even if we're gonna fail i hope somebody is gonna pick that up and, or even finding a little bit of um, uh, uh, seeds to uh, take these to the next step uh, it's, it's all about that it's like it's a joint effort to push the envelope rather than just having the big 